Buongiorno. Welcome to Making Stuff with Chris Dayhut. In today's video, we're going to take a look at utilizing e-stop switches and limit switches with a Raspberry Pi Pico. And we're going to do that using interrupts. What we're going to cover is what are these types of switches, where they are used and why they are used, we're going to cover a very specific warning about utilizing this in dangerous situations. Uses for these switches and this code in your projects. We'll review a fritzing wiring diagram so you can become familiar with how to wire up this. And finally, uh, we'll be going over an example program using interrupts with these two types of switches. So join me on this journey as we explore this further. E-stop switches date back to the turn of the last century. They've been around for a very long time, um, and they've gone by different names over the course of their lifespan. In our example here, what we're looking at is a device that you would be able to press to stop something from continuing operation. And that's something uh, could be anything from a little robot that you've created or a mechanism that might be uh, moving the little objects around, whatever the case may be. Limit switches, on the other hand, are slightly different in that their intended purpose is to limit the motion or limit the travel of something. Perhaps you have an actuator or robot arm where you only want it to move so far and it can't go past that endpoint. That's where a limit switch would be used. Now let's take a quick look at what they are here on the breadboard example. This is an emergency stop button, a rather small one, and I believe I pulled it off of a CNC machine that I had built a number of years back. This is a very nicely uh, built one. Uh, their operation is a little different than most other switches. You press it in, it stays in, it latches in, you rotate it to release it. And that's very common of many types of emergency stop switches. A limit switch, this being a very small one in the micro category or classification, um, your axes would move up to this point, trip the switch, and the motion should stop based on the input going back to the controller. Now, I do have to warn you about this. I don't want you to use these devices on anything that is dangerous or could cause injury to a person or an animal or otherwise. That's a whole different animal there in that generally industrial safety circuits are all done electrically and avoid and bypass software completely. That is inherent to making them extremely safe. So, in the industrial world or in anything that is heavy mechanical, you would have to follow completely different rules and regulations to make that equipment safe. We're using it here in very simple applications that if it's, for example, a little desktop robot, if it runs away, you can hit the e-stop button and it won't hurt itself or bump into the wall or fall off the table, something of that nature. Please do not use this in an industrial or heavy-duty application that would require proper safety circuitry. We can use these switches through software as we're about to explain. Now, uh, the e-stop uh, button is usually used uh, uh, on various devices so that you can stop it. It shuts down everything that it's doing and it can't do anything more until you fix the problem. Whereas the limit switch is used as, say, on the front of a little bumper car or a bumper robot that could go along a wall and bump into it. Okay, well then in that case that might be a signal for you to back up or something of that nature. Or perhaps it gets trapped in an area and you have to go there and physically interact with the little robot and remove it from the environment and restart the software. So that's more of the application that we're going to discuss in the wiring diagram and in the following source code or example program. So let's take a look at the Fritzing wiring diagram to see what our test uh, setup looks like so that we can understand the code a little better. 
In the Fritzing diagram, there are four different circuits here. Up here, we're seeing the limit switch circuit. Down below is our emergency stop circuit. Up on the left here is an LED circuit that is representing our work that we're doing. And again, in the lower left-hand corner, we've got an LED representing some work that we're doing. Now, these LEDs could be representative of stepper motor, a, a, a DC motor, something controlled by a relay, whatever it would be. So, obviously, this is not a realistic example, but it makes it very handy for us to show the cause and effect of the limit switch hitting something and causing an effect over here on this LED. The wiring is fairly straightforward for both switches. Um, what we're going to do is use uh, GP14 as the input for the limit switch, and we're going to pull that signal high, meaning that just sitting idle, this will be pulled up to 3.3 volts. It's a normally open switch, so when the switch closes, it'll carry the signal to ground through this wire here connected back to the ground pin on the Pico. The same is true on the emergency stop button. We're using pin number 17 for the switch and that is pulled up to 3.3 volts. If the switch is pressed, it's going to connect circuit back to ground thus pulling the input to 0 volts. And that's true on both the limit switch and the emergency stop. The two LED circuits are identical. Uh, we're just going out of the uh, GP pin 15 for this LED. It goes through a 220 ohm resistor, which isn't precisely calculated, but handy for this uh, example. Goes to the long leg of the LED. L uh, short leg of the LED connects to ground back through the ground rail. And that exact same thing is copied onto the other side. At the breadboard, we've got the exact same circuitry copied for our limit switch, our two LEDs, and our emergency stop switch. Now that you're familiar with the wiring of our switches and our work that we're doing, uh, we can take a look at the source code of how all this is going to work. And it's uh, broken out into little block areas where I can explain each step along the way. Inside our program, we're going to import a couple of libraries. The machine library, which gives us access to all our uh, input and output pins. And then we're going to have access to the micro Python version of the time library. And that's just uh, used in our example here to slow down our main loop down below. Now we're going to start out by creating a couple of objects that are used for our LEDs to control them. And uh, those are representing the work in a driven circuit. The, whatever actuator, motor, stepper, servo, whatever it is, that's what these are representing for our example. So we're going to create one LED that's called limit switch LED. And that'll be part of that circuitry. And it's created with machine.pin uh, command. And we're using GP pin 15 and we're setting that as an output. The e-stop is done exactly the same way, that LED. Machine.pin number 16 is the pin that we're using for that one. We'll turn on both of the LEDs to simulate a, a running circuit, and that is done very simply by saying limit switch LED dot on, parentheses, e-stop, LED dot on, uh, parentheses. That turns both of the LEDs on. On these two lines, we're going to create the objects that represent our switches. And again, that's done with the machine library and the pin class. And we're using pins 14 and 17, respectively, for limit switch and for e-stop. We use the machine.pin in statement to establish these as inputs and I want both of these pulled up to the high signal because remember our switch is open and when closed it will pull it to ground. These are the two interrupt handlers that will handle each of the switches. And they're nearly identical. Uh, an interrupt handler is a function 
defined very much like any other function, but it's, it will be run when the interrupt occurs. In the case of our limit switch handler, we want to turn off our limit switch LED. We're going to turn off that work or that axis of motion or that element of the arm on your robot, etc. And that will stop instantaneously and very rapidly. Um, and then we're just going to print a warning down below in the shell so that we know something happened. The interrupt handler for the e-stop switch is identical, except for that we're turning off the e-stop LED. And of course its name is different. Starting these up requires these two lines, otherwise those functions would never occur. And we do that uh, by using a, a method for the object, in this case limit switch, uh, the IRQ. Uh, we want our trigger to occur as the pin is falling because we know that we're pulled up high and as that switch is uh, connected to ground it's going to fall. So we would use the falling uh, transition. And then the handler to run when that occurs is our limit switch handler. The same is true of our e-stop. We're going to set up the interrupt request uh, we're going to trigger on the pin falling, and we're going to run the e-stop switch handler. Now at this point, all this code uh, for the interrupt, interrupt request and these handlers is running completely autonomously of our program. Now almost all MicroPython programs will have a continuously running endless main loop, and that's what we're showing down here. And all I'm doing is just uh, adding one to a, a counter, printing that counter, sleep for a half a second, just to show that there's activity going on over here on the counters. We'll go ahead and click the Run button. Over here on our breadboard, we can see that both LEDs are busy doing all the fabulous work that they're supposed to be doing in our project. So the first one we're going to do is we'll trigger the limit switch. Now there's a couple of places uh, you'll have to look at the same time. Of course, the action of me pressing the limit switch and then over in the program, what uh, pops up on the screen and what happens to the LED. So we'll hit that. And you'll notice I got a bunch of uh, limit reached warning messages that printed out. So I'm gonna stop the program and we'll look at that real quick. Now, when I press that button, that was pretty much instantaneously from off to on, on the switch contact. The light went off immediately, and in that brief couple of microseconds of time, that interrupt handler, our limit switch handler, ran this many times. That response is what makes an interrupt so good. It happens extremely fast. It has no bearing on sleeps or dwells or any other activity. As soon as this condition, the falling of that signal, is met, it runs the interrupt handler. And it runs it many times until we're past that transitional state of falling. So it means that, means that it won't run if it's at zero volts and it won't run when it's at 3.3 volts. Only as that transitions from 3.3 volts down to zero. And it ran that many times. That's how amazing these, these interrupts are and how fast they are. Uh, but that also is a drawback for most other types of switches because now your program logic has to deal with this in an interrupt. And that gets very tricky. Without interrupts, you can deal with switch bounce very easily. Uh, but inside interrupts, it's a, it's a much bigger challenge. Now let's go ahead, we'll run this again, and we'll look at how the e-stop response is. We'll run. We'll clear out all our data there. We'll hit the e-stop button. Light went out. And I'll stop the program so that we can look at it further. And look at that, how many e-stop triggers and signals there were when that fired. A lot. 
So as you can see, interrupts handle uh, a reaction very, very efficiently and effectively. Uh, there is no faster way other than directly wiring these switches up to the device electrically to turn them off. So hopefully this gives you an idea and an understanding of how to work with e-stop switches, limit switches, and interrupts in your programs for projects that are not able or capable of harming a person. Hopefully that gives you a real good idea of working with the e-stop and limit switches for your small uh, hobbyist level projects that are not capable of harming or injuring a human or other living being. Uh, keep this type of uh, example to the simple small projects and have fun with it. Uh, keep in mind uh, there's been many a programmer before you and after you that have worked with uh, debouncing the switch contacts in interrupts. Um, it's a lot of work, it is possible, but generally it's more work than worth to get rid of the problem. So you just handle your code in a manner where it can tolerate these multiple repeated uh, executions of the interrupt handler. Before we close this out, I would like to mention that the source code and the fritzing diagrams are available on our companion website for download. I've got a link down below for that. Also on that companion website, you'll find a table of contents and a listing and descriptions of all the videos that I've published over the past year, and especially of importance to you, all the ones for the Raspberry Pi Pico. Well, thanks again for spending time with me today as we discussed these e-stop and limit switches along with interrupts. I look forward to seeing you in the next video.